McDougal, panel discussion on immigration law in an election year. Uh, we might wonder where immigration law went in an election year with the economy going as it has gone, and maybe that's one of the issues that can be uh, reflected upon today. I won't spend a lot of time with introductions because we have four wonderful panelists and you will do a lot better hearing them speak than me speak. But let me just briefly say that Bob Whitehill is somebody I've known for about 15 years, uh, a prominent immigration lawyer from Pittsburgh who, met, uh, who I met the first time doing pro bono work together for a Salvadoran on an asylum case many, many years ago. And it's been love at first sight ever since. Bob is responsible for uh, our immigration clinic, which we started about 10 years ago, surviving as it has. Uh, he's been co-director of the clinic for its entire lifespan. Ira Kurzban is certainly one of the most prominent immigration attorneys in the United States, practicing out of Miami, Florida. Some would say the most prominent immigration lawyer in the United States. Uh, his source book, uh, which almost every immigration lawyer has on his or her desk, is considered the Bible of immigration law, uh, by all except perhaps people in the uh, government enforcement agencies. Uh, he is well known not just for representing immigration clients and being a scholar, but also for representing uh, governments throughout the world, including the Haitian government and agencies of the Cuban government in U.S. courts. Uh, he has never shied away from controversy. Uh, Ira's associate, Jeff Hoffman, uh, we're lucky to have a twofer from Miami, uh, from the Kurzban firm. Uh, in addition to being an associate with this prestigious firm, Jeff has degrees from Harvard, Columbia, and Tulane. Uh, more interestingly than that, he has taught law and literature as well as having a philosophy undergraduate degree, uh, so obviously a Renaissance man. And more important than any of that, he has taught at Punahou, the, uh, <laughs> the high school of what some of us hope will be the next president of the United States. <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying who among some of us because I'm totally impartial. Uh, <laughs> Paul Virtue is our local boy made good, uh, made very, very good. Uh, after getting degrees in pharmacy and in law at WVU, uh, I don't know why he gave up a career in Revco, but he... <laughs> spent time in the federal government until he rose to the rank of general counsel in the INS, um, perhaps one of the <coughs> highest positions held by any WV law school graduate. Uh, he, was, he was general counsel under, I should say, a kinder, kinder and gentler era. Um, presently, he is a partner at Hogan Hartson with its international trade group. With that, I will allow <coughs> Mr. Whitehill, to take the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to be on the same panel as uh, these distinguished and truly, I'm, I'm, uh, these are very distinguished uh, lawyers and a very distinguished professor. Um, but we have an hour and a half to cover an, a whole lot of ground, and so let me try to begin. Uh, and the place of beginning is that um, yesterday afternoon, Jim called me, and he said, Bob, what are you going to talk about? I saw your PowerPoint. Paul and I want to know what in the world your topic is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a mystery. So wait, and maybe you'll, hopefully, what I'm trying, will tr uh, what I'm trying to say will become clear. But I have some prepared words, and then I have a PowerPoint. Um, the election is almost upon us. We'll select new leadership to guide our country into the future. Change has been the mantra of the campaigns of both of the candidates. Immigration issues have been drowned out by concerned, 
concern over the financial meltdown that our country is currently experiencing. But make no mistake about it, immigration has profound economic as well as social implications for our country and has been in meltdown for years, post Paul Virtue, but for, <laughs> for, for years. New leadership in the White House and in Congress will need to address many issues, issues raised by the current status of U.S. immigration law and policy. For example, who do we welcome? Who do we turn away? How many people are admitted and on what terms and conditions are they admitted? How do we balance our economic and security needs? How do we deal with lawbreakers? And all of this while being true to our values that make America, America. In many ways, the answer to these and other immigration questions will reflect who we are as a nation. So as an introduction to the presentations of my colleagues here on the panel, uh, I'd like to present some facts and figures that I think do tell the stories. Now, facts and figures. In political campaigns, we have distorted facts and accusations of distortions uh, of facts. So I am going to try to rely upon numbers that come from the government, almost exclusively. The facts come from, there you go. Oh, thanks. Great. See, I've learned something new. Uh, the, the facts come from the three branches of the Department of Homeland Security, which address immigration. And those three branches are U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. They deal with benefits. U.S. CBP, that is Customs and Border Protection, self-evident. And U.S. ICE, they are cold-hearted. Uh, no, sorry. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So let's take a look at legal immigration. Um, Non-immigrant fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2007. During federal fiscal year 2007, which ends September the 30th, 2007, 170 million admissions. Astronomical number. Admissions doesn't mean means individuals, but may mean individuals who live in Windsor, Ontario, and work in, in um, Detroit. Looking at Lisa, she went to school in Detroit. A um, hundred times a year. May also be uh, my mother-in-law who comes to the United States from, Netherlands, from the Netherlands once a year. But 171 million admissions per year. Of those, all but 37 million are tourists and business visitors from Canada and Mexico with Mexicans with border crossing cards. And then of that 37 million, 90%, 90% of them are tourists. So that leaves about 3,700,000 admissions for individuals who are coming to the United States for either short or long-term visits, non-immigrant visas, are temporary in nature, they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So these include individuals coming to work in the United States on one of these visas or to invest in the United States on one of these visas or study in the United States on one of these visas or be bed, wed, sorry, bed, wed, in the United States on uh, a fiancé visa. There's a little asterisk over the H because the H visas are limited in number and we'll talk about that in a second. In fact, if you want to get a full explanation of what these visa categories are about, there's this wonderful book that I can recommend to you that before the end of the day, I'm going to ask Ira to sign for me. <laughs> now, the visas that non-immigrant employment-based visas um, that are really fundamental to um, employers and employees are these two, the H-2B and the H-1B. H-1B is limited to 65,000 per year, H-2B to 66,000 per year, 
and they are always oversubscribed. There are not enough of them. Employers can't get their employees in the United States on a lawful basis because there are limitations. Immigrant visas. Immigrant visas are permanent visas. They lead to a green card. A green card is the opportunity to live and work in the United States on a permanent basis. Last fiscal year, about a million people became permanent residents of the United States in one of four different categories, either family-based, employment-based, refugee or asylee, or others. You will note the, uh, that preference aliens, and we'll talk about that in a second, family-based preference aliens constituted about 200,000, and employment-based preference aliens, 162,000. Compare that to 171 million admissions to the United States. We're talking about a fairly minuscule number of individuals granted permanent residency um, based upon their family or their employment. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> because there are a limited number of employment-based visas, there is a supply and demand, and individuals need to wait. Uh, for employment-based visas where people have to wait, uh, those who are members of the professions with advanced degrees need to wait um, four, or, four or five years if they are born in, the, in sorry, India or in China. If they are skilled workers whose job has been certified but whose job does not require a master's degree or greater, they have to wait three years if they're born anywhere in the, United, anywhere in the world but for India or China, and for Indian Chinese-born individuals, six or seven years. How about family-based? Family-based is even worse. Family-based, uh, adult children, married or unmarried, of U.S. citizens between six and 17 years that they have to wait before they can apply for their permanent residency. Spouses um, and unmarried children of permanent residents, four to 16 years. And the winner or loser uh, would be citizens, brothers and sisters. These are delayed between one and two lifetimes, between 11 and 22 years. Once a person is a permanent resident of the United States, that person can become a U.S. citizen. And last fiscal year, 660,000 people <coughs> became citizens of the United States. But what I think is inter more interesting is that they had to wait. They'd gone through this gauntlet of a non-immigrant visa, an immigrant visa, waiting to be eligible for naturalization. The, av the median time spent in permanent residency is eight years. Bottom line. There are not enough non-immigrant visas granting employment-based employment authorization. Just not enough of them. Nor are there enough immigrant-based visas, immigrant visas based upon family or employment. And one of the things that this promotes is illegal immigration. Now, people come over the borders. Our borders are huge. Our borders are 5,000 miles between Canada and the United States, 1,900 miles between Mexico and the United States, and a gargantuan number of miles along the seacoast. Customs and Border Protection reports that they, at the ports of entry along uh, our borders, about 200,000 people were en apprehended but four times that number were apprehended at places other than at ports of entry. Now, of those individuals who were apprehended, of the 1.1 million people who were apprehended, 90% of them were apprehended by the Border Patrol. 98% of that 90% were at the southwestern border. And 88% of all of them were Mexican citizens. Just as an aside, over Labor Day, my, I went to the border. I went to uh, the border at Arizona uh, where there was, where there was so much traffic. 
And as I was driving along this two-lane highway, uh, most of the traffic was border patrol, these very large SUVs with this color green emblazoned on them which says border patrol. And along the highway, there was litter, but it was desert. Why was there so much litter? I couldn't quite understand it. And then I asked some, somebody who was a Border Patrol agent, and the Border Patrol agent said, we've got a highway here. And the highway uh, is illegals coming across the border, and as they drain their water bottles, and as they eat their food, they drop it and move on, ergo the litter. Unfortunately, ergo the risk uh, of not having enough water, and more than 200 uh, people died in the desert last year trying to make it across. Nonetheless, um, estimates are that about 500,000 people came to the United States illegally, got through the desert, got through the gauntlet of the Border Patrol, were not apprehended, and added to the number of individuals unlawfully in the United States. So what's the bottom line in terms of border enforcement? In my opinion, geography, the pull of immigration and the lack of legal means to enter the United States makes the southwestern border of this country a dangerous but very active highway for huge numbers of people attempting to enter the U.S. illegally. And by the, by the way, almost all of those individuals are coming to the United States to be reunited with their families or to uh, engage in employment. F to be fair, some are here to... Um, distribute drugs, and to engage in Ill illegal activity. So not all of them are people coming for work, but most of them are. Enforcement in the interior. There is estimated to be about 12 million unauthorized aliens in the United States. Last year, uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement removed about 300,000 individuals from the United States. And at any given time, housed about 30,000. They conducted raids on employment, on employers. These worksite raids resulted in a few thousand, um, and really, in comparison to 11.9 million people, um, arrests of criminal arrests and administrative arrests of about 5,000 is a trivial number. But those numbers have increased, and uh, we are seeing not only more raids but more arrests um, aimed at employers and at employees. So the bottom line in enforcement, workforce compliance, is one of Homeland Security's principal weapons to reduce the number of unauthorized aliens. Compliance Enforcement is on the rise. It is getting tougher on both employers and employees. And in, there is increasing criminalization, which we'll hear about from IRA. Um, and perhaps uh, the exercise of discretion in an indiscreet way to advance our national interests, and that's my opinion. So what I've tried to do in my few minutes is give you some facts and figures um, showing what the some of the immigration problems are that need to be addressed by the next administration. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I was going to speak about uh, criminalizing immigration law. Um, I guess I can stand up further in here. I'm, can, can everyone hear me? Is the mic is removable, and I think we're oh. recording. I think it's removable. Great. 
Um, in a way, this is kind of complementary to, to what Bob was talking about because one of the trends that's happened over the last several years is the efforts to criminalize immigration law. And I, I kind of want to go briefly through the history of it. Let's see if this works. Oh, which one? Okay. Um, we have always had in the immigration laws from the earliest days uh, issues of uh, determining inadmissibility of people who have uh, criminal backgrounds. And one of the interesting and fascinating things about immigration law for me is w when, you, when you look at immigration law, it's really a reflection of our moral views in many respects over a long period of time. So you will see in 1875, we just said no convicts can come into the United States, very generically determined. By 1891, we started to talk about crimes of moral turpitude, although, um, as all the panelists here know, uh, Congress has never defined what a crime of moral turpitude is, uh, and it uh, keeps changing. For example, um, not too long ago, Congress said that, uh, that, I'm sorry, the courts have said that dealing in drugs is a crime of moral turpitude, something that uh, the courts had said probably for 50 years was a regulatory crime. So. What we decide is a crime of moral turpitude, I think, has a, a, in, in large respect to do with, you know, where we are as a nation and, and uh, how we view these things, both politically and morally. 1931 was the first time they started to regulate drugs, and at that time we did not regulate uh, possession of drugs. It was only much more recently that possession of drugs became a crime. 1940 firearms. Uh, the, the major dividing line really came in 1988 for the first time when Congress devised something called aggravated felonies. And the reason why that's so significant is that aggravated felonies carry um, uh, with it uh, many other harsh consequences. For example, if you're an aggravated felon uh, or determined to be an aggravated felon, you cannot um, uh, obtain political asylum in the United States even if you would be executed if you went back to your home country. If you're an aggravated felon, you're subject to mandatory detention in the United States. First time in our history uh, that the Supreme Court upheld mandatory detention irrespective of whether somebody is a flight risk or likely to harm others. If you're designated or believed to be an aggravated felon, you're just detained, period, with no right to bond, no right to go before a judge, no right to prove that you would not be a risk to anyone, and you're detained until there's a final determination. Uh, so who is an aggravated felon and who isn't is a very, very important uh, determination under our law, and that ball has been steadily moving. When the law first came out in 1988, you were an aggravated felon if you were involved in major drug trafficking, major arms trafficking, or murder. Uh, Congress successively over the years has now reduced uh, what an, uh, who is an aggravated felon so that somebody who's involved in a attempted car theft at the age of 18 would now be considered an aggravated felon and subject to all the penalties that I mentioned. 1996, um, as you can see, uh, a number of concerns, as we are today as a society, concerned with uh, things like domestic violence, stalking, child abuse, all became um, grounds for deporting people. And then finally, in the past uh, two years, the most recent ground is a failure to register as a sex offender. Now, where do I go here? Okay. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, as I said, we've kind of successively gone from something called the Omnibus Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 that defined aggravated felons to the Immigration Act of 1990 that broadened the definition of aggravated felonies uh, until finally the Illegal Immigration Reform Act of 1996, which was kind of the watershed in immigration law. It radically expanded the definition to include virtually all felonies. It included mandatory detention. It removed the possibility of getting relief if you were ever a, um, a deemed to be an aggravated felon. It's virtually impossible to get things like voluntary departure or what we call cancellation of removal or other forms of relief from deportation irrespective of how long you've been in the United States. This was uh, kind of a zero tolerance view. 
uh, so that, uh, say you came when you were two years old and you're now 40 and you committed a crime uh, uh, 15 years ago and have not had any problems since then, uh, the uh, immigration authorities, if they know about it and if it's deemed to be a crime, uh, an aggravated felon, you're virtually subject to deportation without any relief. There are, there are certain exceptions, but generally, if the crime was committed after 1996, for sure, uh, there is uh, a, a virtually no relief that's available. They also redefined what a conviction and sentence was, so that if you're sentenced and the sentence is probated or, you, uh, or the sentence is withheld, it's still deemed to be a sentence under immigration law. A conviction, uh, you know, when I tell my friends who do criminal law what a conviction is in immigration, they're, they, they're uh, astounded. Uh, only in immigration law, in the wonderful world of immigration law, is a uh, expunged conviction still a conviction? Is a withholding uh, conviction still a conviction for immigration purposes? And um, even a vacated conviction, one where the court has now vacated and dismissed it, may still be a conviction for immigration purposes if the purpose of the vacator was for immigration purposes. So um, there are very harsh consequences. The result of this uh, is, um, well, first of all, how did it happen? Let's talk about that. Uh, one of the ways that it happened was that um, uh, members of Congress and those people who I think represented the, the, the uh, most anti-immigrant sentiments in the United States began to define people who were undocumented in the United States as illegal and therefore criminal. Um, there is no term, as my colleagues will tell you, there is no term in the immigration law of illegal aliens. Either people are documented or they're undocumented, and that often is an extremely complicated question as to when and under what circumstances is someone documented. Well, the term started to be used, illegal alien, and of course, you know, people say, how can a human being be illegal? Um, but, uh, you know, that's how this notion equating illegals with being criminals. The second is this notion, a uh, somewhat fraudulent notion, that our jails are filled with illegal aliens, and that came from, you know, uh, the one or two horrendous crimes that have been committed by undocumented people that were played over and over and over again in the press. You know, I always talk about Lou Dobbs. He has the same Mexican jumping over the same wall in every single one of his, sh his shows. You know, it's kind of uh, humorous for, the, for those of us who practice. Uh, and the, the point is they can take one example and continually repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as a way of kind of searing it in the American mind that our jails are full of undocumented aliens. The fact is, uh, as I point out here, that immigrants are five times less likely to be in prison. The only real study that's been done in this found uh, that 3.5 percent of the incarcerated for native-born, um, if you looked at, if you compared native-born people to uh, immigrants, you see the numbers there. Um, people who are immigrants are far less likely to be incarcerated of native-born men between the ages of 18 and 39. Uh, crime rates are lowest in the states with the highest immigration populations, uh, 19 states had a 13.6% decline. The 19 largest, the, the states that have, 19 states that have the largest immigration population had a 13.6% decline in, in, in the crime. The remaining states uh, uh, only had a 7.1% decline. Consequences. There's now greater deportation of lawful permanent residents. And one of the things that we see as practitioners uh, I always tell people, you know, about uh, after the 1996 Act came out, I started to put a tissue box on my, on my desk. I mean, it's sad and, it, you know, it's kind of gallows humor, but what you see more and more and more when you practice immigration law is people who have been here virtually their whole lives. I mean, they really don't know another country. They may have come here when they were two or three years old. They became residents and uh, got involved in what, I think many of us would consider minor criminal activity, and they're now faced in a situation where they are subject to deportation without any relief. 
And it's stunning um, when you sit there and you explain to someone who's married to an American citizen who may have two or three American citizen children that there really is nothing that we can do, that you really are going to be deported and you can never come back to the United States, when often they don't even know uh, what it's like to live in another country. Uh, greater incarceration, we've now seen on the immigration side, um, uh, as Bob pointed out, uh, the um, the uh, United States Immigration Customs Enforcement is now one of the largest jailers uh, in the world. Um, we now incarcerate 30,000 people on a regular basis in immigration. Most of those people have no criminal record at all. Uh, they're just people who were picked up and are subject to deportation. And the government, again, is now going more and more and more toward a policy of kind of zero tolerance, not allowing people to go out. Jeff, I, I think, is going to speak uh, uh, much more about this. And then we have the greater use of local law enforcement, what we call the 287G uh, uh, provision. Under the Immigration Act, there is a provision that says uh, the federal government can affect deputize local law enforcement, state law enforcement people. Um, and we now have uh, that in 55 different localities in the United States with some interesting consequences because, you know, uh, some of us up here have been practicing immigration law many, many years, and we will tell you that we don't know uh, uh, as much as we, as we should know about immigration law. It's kind of inconceivable that you're going to train a police officer in a local community somewhere in two weeks or three weeks to be an expert on immigration law and make kinds of fine distinctions that we find difficult to make after many years. But that's exactly what the 287 program does. And for years, uh, in this kind of paradigm, what we did as immigration lawyers is we often advised criminal lawyers about what to do and how to do it in terms of pleading their clients and also what to do in terms of trying to get clients uh, out of detention if they've been placed in detention. And I think today what you have is a complete paradigm shift. We have now gotten to the point where it's not a matter of deporting people because of uh, their conduct uh, in the United States. We are now in the position of trying to criminalize uh, what otherwise would be considered civil conduct. Most immigrants in deportation proceedings don't have the rights that a criminal defendant would because for 200 years the Supreme Court has said, 150 years the Supreme Court has said, immigration is a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. And therefore you don't have the right to speedy trial. You don't have the right to appointed counsel. You don't have a right to many of the things that criminal uh, defendants would have a right to uh, because it's a civil matter. Now what we're seeing is this paradigm shift where we're treating this civil matter as a criminal matter. Um, so we are now punishing uh, people um, who would have been in, uh, we're going from a, a system really that's punishing civilly criminal conduct to criminalizing civil conduct. And we're doing that by enforcing criminal statutes regarding immigration conduct, legislating higher penalties, uh, so, for example, uh, for many years, people who were found in the United States after deportation would simply just be deported. Again, uh, Congress a number of years ago after 1996 and thereafter began to raise the penalties. So for those of you who know something about uh, criminal sentencing, there's now a 16-level upward adjustment in the sentencing structure for somebody who re-enters the United States uh, who committed an aggravated felony. So that means that person's looking at about six to eight years in jail, maybe more. Um, it's very easy to convict somebody of a found in case because all you have to do is show that they were deported before and show that they're in front of you, that they're found in the United States. So prosecutors have kind of latched onto this because it's a very, very easy way in which to raise the numbers. And I'll show you what some of those numbers are. Um, by April of 2008, 58%, 58%, it's pretty astounding actually, of all federal prosecutions were immigration related. Um, and, and so what you're having is now all over the country, particularly in places like Texas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, somewhat in Florida, 
Um, you now have these cases being prosecuted, these found in, you know, a lot of these are these kind of found in cases where they just find the person in the U.S. because it's very easy to prosecute. They can show large numbers of prosecutions and so forth. Uh, by March of 2008, there were 9,350 immigration prosecutions. It represented a 72% increase over 2007. It represents a 193% increase uh, over five years ago. Uh, Department of Homeland Security has increased uh, its criminal worksite enforcement by 530% in the last four years. The watershed here, and I'm sure many of you have read about this or heard about it, is what happened in Postville, Iowa, where the immigration authorities raided uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement raided a uh, meatpacking plant in Postville, Iowa. For the first time, they rounded up. Typically, what uh, immigration would do in a raid uh, is they would bring everybody in. They would determine uh, people who were lawful or not. Sometimes they'd make mistakes. Um, and uh, they would deport those people. They'd put them in deportation proceedings, or they'd ask them if they want to leave voluntarily, and they would leave. This was kind of a watershed because for the first time they rounded up everybody and they criminally charged them. And they charged them basically with having false documentation. The same kind of false documentation a student may have who's 18 years old and wants to go and drink uh, and, and has a phony driver's license or something to prove that they're 21 years old when they're really 18 or something like that um, because it's any document whether it's a federal document or a state document or a local document, any one of those would qualify as a violation of 18 U.S.C. Uh, 1028. And what they did is they said to these people, look, we're going to charge you with aggravated uh, uh, document fraud, and that holds a minimum penalty of two years. All these laws, by the way, uh, really began to be enforced after 9-11. And the, the reason was, you know, we don't want terrorists to come into the United States using false documents. Obviously makes sense, but what they're doing is they're applying that concept to people whose only crime is to work. And I think one of the issues, you know, I discussed this this morning with some of the students, one of the moral issues we have in the United States is, as well as a legal issue, should we really be criminalizing work? because that's what we're really doing. We're saying to people, simply by working, you are a criminal. Um, and we're doing it uh, by, you know, in, in, the, in the guise, really, of, the, of these so-called document fraud, but the document fraud is of such a minor nature. I mean, these are not people who are creating documents. Sometimes they're using somebody else's Social Security number. That's enough to convict somebody under this statute. So uh, in Postville, they charged 300, uh, 307 people pled guilty. They were all uh, sent to jail for a, a period of anywhere from three to six months. It was like a gauntlet. Uh, this was not a, uh, a, a moment in our uh, legal uh, history that we can be proud of. It was where the federal judge was actually working with the prosecutor before they were prosecuted. Um, and they brought all these people in. They kind of ran them through a gauntlet. The attorneys were appointed attorneys who each had, you know, 30, 40 cases, and basically they just pled everybody guilty. Um, uh, and so all these people are now serving criminal sentences. But we're seeing this repeated now in Waco, um, um, in, in uh, uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, in July of this year, 13 people were convicted again for, you know, quote, misusing Social Security cards, probably means they had somebody else's Social Security number, but it's basically prosecuting them for work. Same thing in Columbia Farms, 300 were arrested. Um, the, the um, I, I'm not, you know, because of time, I mean, there's a lot of different crimes that they're now using, reentry after deportation, being found in after deportation and so forth. But the major weapon that's being used is kind of this document fraud. And the interesting thing is, instead of going after the employers, there is some of that, but very little of it, they're really going after the people who are working. And there's uh, lots of ways in which one can treat this problem if you really wanted to focus on making sure that people weren't working illegally. You could raise and enforce the standards that we have 
uh, at the, in the workplace under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, and so forth, uh, under the uh, prevailing wage acts to make sure that people are getting uh, the minimum wage or the prevailing wage that they're required to get and target the employers. The current administration has decided really to target the aliens for working. And uh, the, the consequence is obvious. It doesn't end the exploitation of foreign workers. It doesn't give uh, jobs any more to U.S. workers because, uh, you know, once these 307 people are removed, they're going to bring in more people. Uh, basically to do the same thing. It keeps wages depressed. Uh, it doesn't solve the, the, uh, the real problem. Uh, it does send a message, obviously, to people. But uh, as you know from the numbers that Bob was talking about before, the reality is that people are going to keep coming as long as there are um, uh, a job available in the United States. Um, and it's not going to solve the problem with respect to employing American workers. So one of the things that I've recommended in all of this is that we really uh, uh, look at how we're enforcing our labor laws in the United States and determine, uh, you know, as Bob was saying before, kind of a humane way in which to bring people into the country in a lawful way so uh, that people aren't forced, as they are today, really to come in illegally. Thank you. First, let me thank uh, Jim, and uh, let me just say that this is uh, uh, an honor to be on this distinguished panel. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to follow, follow up with what Ira, uh, Ira Kurzman was saying about uh, criminalization of the immigration laws, but specifically I want to focus today on, on issues of detention. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about this uh, specific issue is because I think that there is not a lot of clarity in terms of people's understanding of who can be detained, uh, how long people can be detained, whether people can be, whether people can be, um, thank you, whether people can be uh, released from detention, what are the standards, uh, the criteria for release, mandatory detention. And these are all very, um, you know, as, as we've heard, as far as the, the number of people being detained, I think I think Bob said 30,000 people were, were currently detained, um, and the millions of people, or, or 171 million admissions per year, um, all those people potentially are subject to detention. Basically, if you're a non-citizen, um, then you're subject to detention uh, if you're accused of being subject to deportation or removal. That's, that's a very important point. Everybody who enters the country um, can be placed in detention. And let, let me just give you one example of this which, which, um, which may be surprising. If you come into the United States and you, uh, let's say, come from Haiti and you declare asylum upon arriving, um, there's a policy now from the Department of Homeland Security that you must be detained. You must be placed in detention and sent to Chrome uh, Detention Center. So uh, here's an example of, you know, commonsensically we think of detention as, okay, the person may be committed a crime, the person uh, has some sort of uh, crime involving moral turpitude or, or aggravated felony, um, but actually that may not be the case. The person may just be uh, coming into the country saying, look, I, wanted to, I want to uh, um, come in for purposes of asylum, which is perfectly legitimate under international law, um, and then they're placed in detention. Another example uh, is if someone has, uh, let's say they've overstayed a B2, B1, B2 visitor's visa, um, and uh, maybe, maybe they've overstated and thought that they could stay because they've married an American citizen, that person is subject to detention. Um, another example is, um, for example, if, if, if someone has uh, violated, uh, an, let's say, an F1, a student visa, and for some reason, for whatever reason, changed schools or didn't, you know, dot their I's or cross their T's in terms of the F1, um, they're subject to detention, and we've, Mr. Kurzman and I have had cases uh, uh, along those lines. So it's, it's not, I guess the important, first important point is it's not just uh, persons who are um, involved in, with the criminal system. Now, what, what, what kind of categories are there in terms of detention? There's uh, basically um, Immigration Nationality Act Section 236 
um, authorizes an immigration judge to release um, a person who is, who is in detention, um, but you have to show certain things. For example, you have to show that they're not a flight risk, not a danger to the community, um, and that they have certain ties to the country, et cetera. Um, but the, the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, also has a provision for mandatory detention. In it. And Ira has already mentioned a little bit about mandatory detention. Um, mandatory detention is a very, has become a very wide, um, very large category. It didn't, it didn't used to be so large. It used to only apply to aggravated felony. Now, actually, and, and this may be another thing that, that the public doesn't, doesn't uh, fully appreciate, Mandatory detention, which basically means mandatory means you have to stay in detention um, throughout the entire period uh, where the Department of Homeland Security is trying to deport you. So that could be one year, that could be two years, that could be three years. If you fight your case, like some of our clients, I mean, we, we fight when, when we fight the cases, um, it sometimes takes years. So. So if, if you fall into this mandatory detention category, it, it has very uh, serious consequences for the clients. Um, mandatory detention is not just for aggravated felonies. Um, the 236C also says the mandatory detention also applies to people who have been convicted of a CIMT, which, are, which is a crime involving moral turpitude, where the sentence imposed has been one year or longer. Uh, it also says that you subject to mandatory detention if you've been convicted of two or more CIMTs, um, notwithstanding the sentence. So this could be something like um, even stealing a pair of sunglasses or shoplifting or something very, very minor. Um, you still may be subject to to uh, to mandatory detention, which which again is basically people serving a sentence. Um, incarcerated in jail um, where I practice Chrome Special Processing Center or Chrome Detention Center basically a jail uh, <laughs> so it's it's uh, it, it's really you know picking up on Iris point it's really kind of criminalizing um, um, criminalizing this this what's supposed to be a civil um, has always been a civil process in terms of removal and uh, deportation um, now, in terms of people who are subject to mandatory detention, um, there is one caveat that if you're released after October 9th, 1998, um, pursuant to the, the, the IRA, IRA the, 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 the act that, that we, we put up, uh, Mr. Kurzban put up on, on, on the screen, um, if you're released after that date, then there's a loophole and you're not subject to mandatory detention. Now, the problem with that is that there's been a recent um, BIA litigation, Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, BIA case that said basically that re that released after date doesn't have to apply to the conviction that you're being deported for. In other words, if you're, let's, let's say you're, you're being deported for something that occurred 15 or 20, 25 years ago, and you were released in, in the early 90s or in the 80s. Well, if for any reason you got picked up and were placed, uh, for example, you were not even charged, but you were uh, in, in, the, in a process of uh, uh, being, being uh, detained for reckless driving or some other offense, and then you were released after 1998, totally unrelated to the, to the, the charge that, that you're um, being deported for, that's still considered mandatory detention. So the, the Board of Immigration Appeals has, has filled the gap uh, and basically, in, in many cases, um, done away with the, the, the released after um, um, uh, provision. Um, in, terms of, in terms of other categories where people are subject to, to mandatory detention, another category is someone who's an, considered an arriving alien. So if you're an arriving alien uh, coming into the country and you're picked up at the border, uh, I think Bob said that there were um, 200,000 apprehensions at the border, I think was, was, the, was, the, uh, was the statistic, then those 200,000 people, if they're considered arriving aliens into the country, technically, um, if I go down to immigration court and file a motion for a bond, the judge is going to say, 
which has happened, he said this to me before, <laughs> the judge is going to say, well, I find he, this person is an arriving alien and I have no jurisdiction to consider bond. So, no bond. Um, and then, you know, this, this becomes a very um, difficult position. Whether or not the person has ever been convicted of a crime, whether or not the person is an aggravated felon or, or has, has anything to do with um, criminal activity. Um, uh, other, other people, obviously terrorists, security-related grounds, are subject to mandatory detention. Um, and those with final administrative orders of removal are also subject to mandatory detention. Um, now, why, why is mandatory detention, uh, in my estimation, so, so important uh, an issue? And, and as you say, I think many people probably saw the 60 Minutes um, program that was, I think, maybe five, six months ago that was aired. Um, there are many, many uh, severe medical issues um, and other issues that come up when people are detained for, for a long period of time. And the Department of Homeland Security has not, um, in many cases, dealt with those medical issues uh, sufficiently. And, you know, now there's getting to be more and more um, uh, publicity regarding that. Um, but this is something that, you know, really I think is, is a... Um, it, it's, it's something that, that represents um, an important issue for how we see ourselves uh, as a country in the world. In other words, uh, how, how we present ourselves to the rest of the world and how the world views us um, has a lot to do with how we treat people in terms of, of not just criminals, but how we treat people who come into our country seeking benefits um, and detain them for potentially uh, you know, long periods of time without medical care, without... Um, allowing them to see their families. Uh, the, the other issue that comes up in, in our practice um, in terms of detention is, and this is also a point that I think the public is unaware of, um, they can transfer you. So, for example, let's say you're detained in Miami, um, and then they decide, well, we're going to ship this person to Arizona because uh, they're, now, they're now going toward a trend where they're having large uh, um, consolidated detention centers, so it's, they're getting away from the, the local detentions. Now they're going to have large centers. They have one in Arizona. Uh, they have one in Texas I've been to. Um, and basically what they can do now is, is transfer you. Now what if you have an attorney and you retain an attorney in Miami uh, and then they transfer you to Arizona? Well, the courts have said that this is not a violation of, of the right to counsel. So um, now we've argued that it is a violation and, and they've tried to put in some policies whereby if you file a representation form, the G28, that they will try not to um, transfer people. But we've had clients that, for whatever reason, hurricanes, um, bed space issues, whatever, um, have been transferred, and that person basically is then as, at a severe, uh, a severe disadvantage because the person either has to retain new counsel in Arizona, which, which may not happen, because they've already uh, retained counsel in Miami, or, the, or it's going to become exorbitant to fly out their attorneys wherever they are locally to the immigration court proceeding. Um, or the attorney has to be put in a position of appearing telephonically, which, um, again, is not the best situation when you're trying to represent somebody over the telephone. So these are just some issues which I just wanted to, you know, I won't go into any more detail regarding that, but I think, I think that it, these, these points should be publicized more. Um, Basically, I'll just talk very briefly about the Intensive um, Supervision and Appearance Program. This is called ISAP. Um, ISAP is a program that I, I believe was started a few years ago because there's court cases from 2005, but it really hasn't come into practice. I think there are nine pilot programs now around the country where uh, the Department of Homeland Security is doing an a alternative to detention. Um, and this is basically like an ankle bracelet program, and, and we have a lot of clients that, that, that we've represented um, with respect to the ISAP program. Now, some of the problems with ISAP. Um, the ISAP brochure, which I, which I have here, um, I made a copy of it if anybody wants to look at it after the talk, but the ISAP brochure basically says that there's three phases to the program, the, the intensive phase, the intermediate phase, and the regular phase. According to the brochure, the intense phase, which basically means that uh, you have to wear a, a ankle bracelet and you're subject to um, inspection and, and, and phone calls at any time of the day or night, um, and you have to check in once a week, 
this is supposed to last only one, uh, one month. Uh, then if you successfully uh, complete the one month intense phase, then you're supposed to be placed into the in intermediate phase. Um, in, in my experience, um, they aren't really doing that. So people have been in the intense phase for, for months and months. Um, the brochure also talks about a one year. This is only supposed to be happening for one year. Um, again, we haven't seen that it's limited uh, in terms of the actual application of the program. Um, the other anecdotal, uh, anecdotal uh, piece of uh, information that, that we had a client a few weeks ago who was, who was placed in the program, we, we got her out of the program actually. Um, she reported that she had to plug in to the wall for two hours every day. So, and there wasn't a detention, there wasn't an extension cord um, provided, so she basically had to plug her leg into the wall, um, which obviously, as you can imagine, is, is, um, uh, is, is not too um, uh, convenient. So, um, I had a client, I also had a client about a year ago who, who was very upset because he was placed in ISAP and, and he was told that he couldn't get it wet. So he said, how am I going to, well, take a shower, I guess, is, is, is not too hard if you, can, if, you can, uh, if you can place a plastic baggie or something. But he was very upset because he, he liked to swim. So he was curtailed in, in swimming, especially in Miami. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, something, something it's, it's very uh, restrictive in terms of, 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 of you know, uh, enjoying oneself in Miami. So at any rate, there, there, there are problems with the ISAP program. Now, um, an interesting issue comes up, um, and, and, and we've raised it, Mr. Kurzman and I uh, filed a uh, case in federal court regarding um, allowing somebody to be placed as, as an alternative to detention to be placed in, in ISAP. And the issue is whether an immigration judge has the authority to place someone in ISAP. If, if, let's, say, let's say you're in front of the immigration court and the person is subject to detention, and as, you, as their attorney, it, it might be a reasonable alternative. You might want somebody to be in ISAP rather than at Chrome Detention Center. Um, in, in a case about two years ago, the immigration judge said, I don't have any authority to put somebody in ISAP. That's, I don't have any authority. I can just detain the person. Um, and I don't have any authority. So we, we went to federal court, and the federal judge agreed with us and, and issued a ruling uh, in Savios versus Ashcroft, an un unpublished decision, that the immigration judge does have the authority to, in, to impose conditions on release, in addition to monetary conditions, he can also, also in, impose the ISAP program. Um, another issue that, that I've argued in front of the immigration court is what if somebody is subject to mandatory detention and you want to argue that he should be placed in ISAP because ISAP, from what, according to my argument, ISAP is a form of detention because the person is still subject to custody. There's no question they're in custody, um, but are they in, subject to detention? So um, I did some research regarding that issue. There's only really two cases that deal with um, ISAP in terms of habeas corpus uh, petitions and, and, and ISAP-related um, uh, issues. Basically, what, what the authorities say, there is a case called Lepesh, uh, Lepesh versus uh, BI Incorporated. BI Incorporated is the, the, the contractor who, who administers the program. Basically, what Lepesh... Uh, Lepesh said was that um, there is jurisdiction for a habeas. And in another case, Nagoyan versus BI Incorporated, um, the court said that the ISAP was not detention outside of the, of the statutory authority of ICE. In other words, it was detention. That was my argument, that it was not detention outside the statutory authority, which means, to me, that means it is detention within the authority of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So I made that argument to the immigration judge, and the judge um, said, no, mandatory detention means mandatory detention in, in a facility. It means incarceration. So we did not uh, win that argument. But I think it's an interesting point. Um, there's a lot of cutting edge issues in terms of the interplay between the immigration court and, and, and the ISAP program. Another, another issue is how do you get somebody out of ISAP? So, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I filed a motion to, to release somebody from ISAP. Uh, s several attorneys had told me that, th that the immigration judges were saying, well, I don't have authority. I can't, I can't do anything about ISAP. That's the that's Department of Homeland Security. I'm, I'm the EOIR. I'm the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Uh, I'm not going to touch that. 
Um, I filed my motion because I had uh, some authority under INA 236 and the regulations that know, and, and also Savayos, which is another case that we did about two years ago, that know the immigration court does have the authority to not only put somebody in ISAP, but to remove them from ISAP. So we filed that motion a couple weeks ago, and we, uh, a hearing was scheduled. Um, and the next day, the, the Department of Homeland Security counsel um, called me and said the clients were being released from ISAP. So it never had to actually go to the court, and there was never a determination made by the judge. But the, the DHS counsel, um, I think, wisely um, you know, made it clear that they, um, they were releasing uh, the clients from the program because it wasn't a situation where any detention was, was, uh, was really required. I mean, this is a, this is a family. This was a, a situation where the father was a pastor, um, and there was absolutely no criminal background whatsoever. So um, I just wanted to touch on those, those issues regarding detention. I think they're important in terms of um, for the coming election, for, for, for the fact that they need to be changed in, in many, many respects. Um, and I think that um, basically these are cutting-edge issues in terms of immigration practice. <laughs> Thank you. No. Now that we've heard from Bob and Ira and Jeff about difficulties both with the letter and the enforcement of immigration law, hopefully we'll be uh, enlightened by Paul as to how reform may or may not take place. I hope we're going to be enlightened, yes. Um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Dean McConnell and Professor Freeberg for the invitation to, uh, to join you here today. It's always a thrill to be back. Uh, at the law school. In the Marlon Luger courtroom particularly, uh, when I was here, we could just walk down the hall and talk to Marlon Luger anytime we wanted to. It was a, it was a great time to, uh, to be here, so it was, um, it's always fun to be back. I'm also here for Parents Weekend. Um, I have a son who's a freshman, and he opted to actually go to class today instead of coming and listening to Dad. Uh, I, at least I think he's in class. That's what he told me, so we'll have to see. Uh, Bob and Ira, thanks for that. I, it, you know, it really helps younger attorneys like uh, like Jeff and me to. Uh, <laughs> we got a real lesson from uh, the background you provided, so we we appreciate that. They're going to get back at me, I'm sure, uh, a little bit later on. And I, it, listening to Jeff talk, I really g can appreciate um, attorneys who go into federal court. Jeff talking about the federal court cases and filing motions. I don't do any of that. I, I'm a business immigration lawyer. I represent largely companies who are. Um, recruiting people for positions in the U.S. They go out to, for example, U.S. universities, and guess what? You know, 10 to 20 to 30 percent of the people that they're attracting for positions are foreign students. And so we work to get the visas for those folks. Um, and so by and large, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that kind of work. We represent some sports teams. We represent, um, we do a lot of pro bono, so we represent people in immigration court in particularly asylum or before the agency on Violence Against Women Act cases. Uh, but if one of my clients gets into trouble, I usually call Ira or Jeff or, uh, or somebody um, who has that, that kind of experience. And it's always fascinating to hear uh, the latest about that. Because I have really been away from that for about nine years. I left the government um, a little over nine years to ago to join the, um, uh, the firm. When I was there as general counsel, that's with the people who worked for me. I had about 600 lawyers, uh, and by and large, most of them were representing the, the U.S. Uh, immigration Service, the government, in immigration court or before administrative law judges in proceedings against uh, employers. Now there are close to a thousand lawyers uh, doing that kind of work, believe it or not. Even after the agency split, there's still. Um, so one of the things, even if the law hasn't been able to change much in, in terms of being more favorable, um, uh, there's certainly a lot of money being put on, on immigration. So uh, let me just bear with me here because I want to read something from the President's State of the Union address back in, on January 28th. Um, America needs, and I wish I had a PowerPoint, but I don't, so. America needs to secure our borders, and with your help, my administration is, of course he's talking to Congress, is taking steps to do so. We're increasing worksite enforcement, deploying fences, and advanced technologies to stop illegal crossings. We've effectively ended the policy of catch and release at the border, 
And by the end of this year, we will have doubled the number of Border Patrol agents. And he's talking about over the, the eight years of his administration. Um, yet we also need to acknowledge that we will never fully secure our border until we create a lawful way for foreign workers to come here and support our economy. This will take pressure off the border and allow law enforcement to concentrate on those who mean us harm. We must also find a sensible and humane way to deal with people here illegally. Illegal immigration is complicated, but it can be resolved, and it must be resolved in a way that upholds both our laws and our highest ideals. And that was, uh, those were uh, part of um, President Bush's remarks in the State of the Union Address from this year. And I can't think of really better words to guide the next administration with respect to immigration policy. Um, I, I, it was a little late <laughs> for this speech because we knew, I mean, I was, I'm a Republican. I was actually chuckling at these words when I heard them because I knew there was no legislative opportunity in this calendar year and, and at the end of this Congress to, uh, to affect any meaningful change um, legislatively. What, what do we mean when we talk about the immigration law? Let me just explain what the, the state of our law is, and then I'll talk a little bit about comprehensive immigration reform and the efforts we've seen over the last couple of Congresses. The McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 still remains the foundation on which our modern immigration law, uh, laws are built. Um, and while rarely a year has gone by where we haven't seen some fairly significant changes in our immigration laws. Ira talked about some of those in terms of the 1988 Act with respect to really the, the first time we saw aggravated felonies and then those have, have continued to expand almost on a yearly basis really in, in some form or another. Um, there are just a handful of major legislative reforms that we've seen since the 1952 Act, the McCarran-Walter Act. Um, 1965, the, the 65 Act basically revamped the, revamped the entire immigration process. It eliminated what were then strict country quotas in favor of uh, the preference system that we've heard uh, Bob talk about and Ira refer to as well. Um, then we had the Refugee Act of 1980, which implemented the UN protocol for the protection of refugees and revised our processes. We really had a sort of a hodgepodge of ways to bring refugees into the United States. And the 1980 Act regularized that process and gave us really the, 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 um, the scheme that we have today for accepting um, about 100,000 refugees on an annual basis, year in and year out. There's a negotiation between the administration and Congress on what that number will be on an annual basis, uh, but it's roughly 70 to 100,000 um, yearly. Um, and then in 1986, we saw the Immigration Reform and Control Act, uh, which was uh, a bipartisan uh, product. Uh, Senators Kennedy and um, uh, Simpson on the, um, uh, on the Senate side were really the, the promoters uh, of that bill. Senator Mazzoli played a, I, I'm sorry, Congressman Mazzoli played a huge role on the House side. And, and what we saw was what Senator Simpson referred to at the time was a three-legged stool. We, we secure our borders, stop illegal immigration, we um, take away the job magnet by enforcing measures against employers who hire people who are not lawfully uh, authorized to be employed in the U.S., and we do something with the illegal population, which at that time was estimated to be somewhere between three to six million uh, people unlawfully in the U.S. Uh, so what did we do? We, uh, the 86 Act passed. We legalized nearly three million people out of the, uh, from that three to six, um, both agricultural workers and people who had been here since January of 1982. Uh, so they had, had to have been here at least four years at the time the act passed. Um, and employer sanctions started very slowly to be applied uh, against employers. And what did we do on the border? The same thing we had always done on the border. And so um, we basically had the legalization program, but basically an unfunded program for enforcement against, um, against employers, and the same thing at the border. It was a catch and release situation because we weren't applying appropriations to the problem. We, we had this new law, um, and it, it basically failed miserably. So today we have some seven to 
12, estimates are as high as 15 million people in the United States unlawfully. As much as 7 million people in the workforce here in an undocumented um, status. And so here we are 20 years later, a little more than 20 years later, dealing with the same kind of issues, but on even an even larger scale. And so um, it's a big task. Congress is going to have to tackle it, and the next administration. Um, the Immigration Act of 1990 uh, changed, changed the, um, the grounds of inadmissibility, got rid of some of the ideological grounds of inadmissibility, communism, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and it, it did one thing that I think probably led more to the retirement of immigration officers than anything else. It changed the numbering scheme for the grounds of inadmissibility. And, and so you had not just grounds 1 through 23, which we had at the time, you now had 1.A.3.C. Dot dot and so people, immigration officers gave up and said, you know, I'm close enough to retirement. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to try to learn this. Um, but uh, but it, it, it did a, a number of other things in terms of reform, of, of changing uh, some of the non-immigrant visa categories. It added some non-immigrant visa categories. It, it was the first time we saw a cap on H-1B employees that Bob talked about uh, that is today 65,000. And it's not nearly enough numbers. We have at least twice and even more that, that number of petitions that are received on an annual basis by employers. Uh, but those things were, were um, part of the 1990 Act. And it was a major training effort within the agency. I was there at the time. And uh, we really had to train everybody on, on the new processes and, and um, like I said, the new grounds of inadmissibility. And then we had, in 1996, a major overhaul, really, of the removal process and some of the things that Jeff was talking about in terms of detention, mandatory custody issues. Um, and it was really, it was an enforcement-only bill, basically, and it was really harsh, very, very harsh. We're still trying to deal with some of the um, fallout from that, from that bill, the 1996 Act. And that, that act was passed when we had a, a Democratic administration. And I, I was, I, I would actually, but not, a Democratic Congress. but not a Democratic Congress, that's true. But I, was, I would go to meetings at the White House, and, and we would actually have meetings where we were trying to out-tough the Republicans on, the, and I, I say we, the administration, we're trying to out-tough the Republicans on amendments to the bill, believe it or not. And so you can imagine, as a result, we had just a, a miserable um, uh, enforcement-only bill. One of the things it did, and it did any number of things, was that at the time, we had a regime where people who were in the U.S. unlawfully could pay a fine, a $1,000 fine. It would start out at 500 became a $1,000 fine. And uh, so even though they were here unlawfully, if they otherwise qualified to, for a green card on the basis of family or an employment sponsorship or some other basis, they could pay a fine and adjust their status here in the United States. Well, the 96 Act, based, that was allowed to sunset. And the 96 Act provided that if you've been unlawfully present in the U.S., then, and you leave, either if, it, if you're unpres uh, unlawfully present for six months and you leave, you can't come back for three years. If you're unlawfully present for a year or more and you leave, you can't come back for a year, uh, uh, 10 years, 10 years. And very stingy waiver provision for, you know, probably covered maybe three or four people. Um, <laughs> And, and so what we had was this regime where we had, you could pay a penalty and, and adjust your status as long as you qualified, um, taken away. And so the, the answer, the logical answer would be, okay, well, we're gonna, I'm going to send my client back to their home country to apply for an immigrant visa because they can go home and apply at, at a U.S. consulate. Well, no, they've been here out of status for all this time. They can't go back home and, and apply for a visa. So it's, a, it's the classic Catch-22 situation. We're still operating under that regime, although as general counsel, I tried to create as many exceptions as I possibly could uh, for people who are here um, in a, in, out of status, but uh, we still didn't get that accomplished. That's one of the, if, if, if there were any amendment in the immigration law, if we could just change that, I, we, you know, we would go a long way toward providing some relief for the 
whatever it is, 12 to 15 million people who are here in the United, United States um, unlawfully. And not only that, it's, it would be non-controversial because we're only talking about people who qualify either be based on a family relationship or based on employment sponsorship to be in the U.S. And so just let them adjust. Put the, put the penalty provision back in there and let them adjust. That would be just, you know, if, if I had my, you know, if I were the president and the Congress, because you have to be both, um, <laughs> that's what I would do. Um, and so what we have now is a situation uh, that we were facing in 1986, and uh, it, it's very similar. And so um, it's what is called for here and what the, what the groups have been promoting is something called comprehensive immigration reform. So we're not just dealing with enforcement issues. And I have to tell you, I've been the, I've been the general counsel. We don't need any more enforcement authority. If we, if we did nothing more on the enforcement area except fund positions and fund some programs, we'd be fine. We have all the laws we need on the enforcement side. We just need to, to work on the, um, um, on the legal side, create more numbers, create more opportunities for people to um, be reunited with their families here. Bob talked about some of the numbers. He talked about some of the waiting times for family members. I mean, people don't understand that spouses and children of green card holders have to wait in line. And in some cases, they have to wait in line a long time before they're able to rejoin their, to, to be unified in lawful status with their family members who are green card holders here in the U.S., even U.S. citizens. Some of their, like adult um, uh, sons and daughters of U.S. citizens have to wait in line. Um, so we need, to, we need to deal with some of that. So what's happening in, in terms of, I, I should point out that of the handful, I think I mentioned five different acts, each of those was except with the exception of the 65 Act, and I'm not sure what happened. I'll have, to, I'll have to ask Ira later what was going on in 1965. But the other ones, oh, okay, that's right. Um, no, what, what they did was they revised the quota system, and there was broad bipartisan support for revising it. So that's why you saw immigration reform in an odd year, in an odd-numbered year. Otherwise, immigration reform is always in an even-numbered year. Um, that's why they shouldn't even have tried in 2007, I'm telling you. So we have the 80 Refugee Act, the 86 Immigration Reform and Control Act, the M Act of 1990, and the Immigrant Reform and Immigration Resp Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. Why is that? Because these, things, these bills have to percolate in Congress at least um, one year, if not, if not uh, the full two. And, and actually, a, a few of these we're in the very way, and the 1986 Act, you know, I thought they were just going to, um, they were just going to, they were going to go, uh, because it was in, it was November, we, are, we were in a lame duck Congress in 1986, it's November, they're turning out the lights, actually, literally turning out the lights, um, and they passed the 1986 Act in, at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was, um, it was unbelievably dramatic. Uh, you know, you have to be a little weird to get excited about things like that. But it was unbelievably <laughs> dramatic for somebody who was watching it and there and working for the agency. So, um, but I guess there should be some lessons learned about that, that it, it takes a little bit of time, and, and it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy um, uh, thing to get a bill that, that everybody is satisfied with. Um, there was an attempt made in 2006, and in fact, in 2006, the Senate passed what was a very balanced bill. It provided for a path to citizenship for the some 7 million um, people who were undocumented in the U.S. And it, it, people who had been here five years or more had a, had a faster path, and two to five years had a little slower path, and only two years or less had to actually go home, but they could still apply to come back if they qualified. So it really was going to take care of about 10 million people who had been undocumented in the U.S. That's what the Senate passed. The House passed a, an enforcement-only bill. So there was, and, and so what happens when the Senate passes a bill and the House passes a bill? You go to conference. Well, this, the House never designated their conferees. They just refused to, the leadership refused to designate conferees. And so the... Um, the 109th 
Um, we, lo we lost the opportunity in the 109th Congress for any immigration reform. In, the, in 2007, uh, God bless them, Senator Kennedy, Senator Kyle, Senator McCain, and, and a fairly um, broad group of, of senators um, got together and rather than, than put a bill into committee, have it marked up, have it go to judiciary, have it reported out of judiciary, Kennedy said, we're going to put, we're going to work on this in the back room. We're going to work it all out. And, and they came up with, with what was called at the time the grand bargain, or you know, that, that's how it was referred to in the popular press. And we're going to push this through. We're going to get a cloture vote, limit debate. We'll get it passed uh, in the Senate. The problem was that, um, that the cloture votes, it, it was too political a hot potato for, it, for them to deal with in 2007. The, the bill was brought to the floor, cloture vote failed. Senator Kennedy pulls the bill back. Uh, uh, Senator Reid, actually. Senator Kennedy does uh, Senator Reid pulled the bill back because uh, debate was getting uh, too difficult. Brought to the floor again, cloture vote, cloture vote fails. Which, when a cloture vote fails, then uh, there are, there's a full opportunity for amendments, full opportunity for debate, and full opportunity for filibuster, which was being threatened at the time. Uh, on this bill. This, the bills actually uh, went for cloture votes. One of them actually proceeded on a motion to proceed, got to the floor, amendments were made, and the, cl the final cloture vote at the end to cut off debate failed again. So there were four cloture votes, and in 2007 the um, uh, comprehensive immigration reform failed again. So it's something, I have to tell you just, just a quick thing. I, I was riding the metro into my office, and I, I got a phone call on my cell phone. And um, the person on the other side said, Paul, this is Ted Kennedy. And I, and I, I said, you know, what do you mean it's Ted Kennedy? Are you sure? He said, yeah. So I... Um, so I'm on, and I had the presence of... I had the presence of mind to get off at that stop because I figured if I have cell phone coverage, I'm going to lose it once we go in the tunnel. So, I, And he said, I've, we're considering there's an amendment coming down from the Republicans. It says this, this, and this. And I need for you to come up with three, you know, real-life scenarios on how this is going to affect, you know, real people. And I need it, you know, like in 15 minutes from you. And I, Kennedy's, I am good, have really good friends, and Ira does too, on, on Kennedy's staff. And, and so... Um, they were scrambling around, and that's how it is. When the, when there's a bill on the floor of the Senate, they're reaching out to even people like me, to um, uh, to try to give them some help on these things because there are so many things hitting so quickly. I, there are there were probably ten amendments, twelve amendments that Kennedy was dealing with personally, on a you know on a daily basis. So I think you have to have an appreciation for how hard this is, how hard they work. And, they, you know, it's basically around the clock for these guys when they have a bill on the, uh, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, but it just didn't get done. And so hopefully next time around. But never in an election, never in a presidential election year. All, all of these, actually, the Refugee Act of 80 was in a presidential election year. But that's an exception. And, again, bipartisan um, support for that. And it was, it was basically a fait accompli. But you're never going to see an immigration bill in a presidential election. You may have answered the one question that I had for you folks with your last comment. Why, after years of heated public debate and high-profile demagoguery, do we hear so little in this election season about immigration policy? Uh, well, the economy has overtaken it. it. It's just the economy by well, itself? I, I, actually, I think I think um, even when, and, um, uh, e even before the the crash, um, they weren't talking about it. You know, McCain M McCain was a major major supporter of immigration reform. Obama during the primaries was uh, supportive of um, comprehensive immigration reform, and you don't hear anything. And uh, I was telling some of the students this morning. 
Part of it is uh, immigration's really become kind of a radioactive issue. Um, the members of Congress, liberal, conservative, across the board, are receiving mail. They say, what, at the rate of 10 to 1, 20 to 1, you know, it says kick everybody out of the country. You know, just get them out. We don't want these people here because the people who oppose immigration are well-funded, well-organized, um, you know, and, and in many respects, this represents, you know, issues to me uh, now because of the way it's been so politicized. I think at the time, you know, that Paul was talking about in, in, in certainly in 86, it was, it was politicized, but it was less somehow, I think, politicized. Now it's really become a, a, a hot potato in, in the way that, you know, issues about pro-choice and abortion are issues. And um, you know, the, the, the instinct of a member of Congress when confronted by a very controversial issue is to do nothing. Um, and, you know, we uh, each year, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, you know, has people go and talk to their members of Congress. And, um, you know, when you go and you talk to members, they're just afraid of it. I mean, that, that was, that's my reaction. I don't know if, Bob, you share that or... Uh, well, actually, I have a question for the, the, the rest of you, and, and that is... Um, Assuming that we're not going to have comprehensive immigration re reform anytime soon, you see piecemeal immigration reform. Are there, I mean, the R1 visas have been extended, uh, E-Verify has been extended, and so on. Um, what, what do you see as the possible fixes, little they, though they may be, and not comprehensive? One, one quick follow-up on what Ira said, and then I'll give you my two cents on that. Um, not only were they sending letters, they were sending, people were sending bricks. They were sending bricks asking for their, their congressmen and senators to build a fence. And they got so many bricks, it was unbelievable. I mean, they just had to have, you know, forklifts come into the uh, mail room over, <laughs> over, at the, over on the hill, no kidding. Um, so that, just sort of a funny aside on that. Um, I, there, I think what will happen, Bob, is that the... Uh, proponents of comprehensive immigration reform, the people who are supporting it um, on the Senate, on the House, and among the groups are going to try to hold it together as long as they can. That's what they were trying to do in, in 2006 and 2007. And in other words, hold a full, complete, comprehensive package together until it becomes clear that we're not going to get it. And, and once it becomes clear that we're not going to get it, we might see some piecemeal legislation. For example, there was a trial balloon sent up earlier this year in March, I think it was March, um, on the uh, DREAM Act. The DREAM Act would provide legal status for, for kids who went to high school here, essentially. And um, it, it, closure vote failed on that. Yeah, and, and everybody and it, thought that was kind of non-controversial. After all, you know, right. these are kids who came here when they were very young. It wasn't their choice to come to the United States. They're now in high school. Many of them have scholarships to go to college. They're doing, you know, exceptionally well, and they can't get those scholarships, and they can't go to college. So most members, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, we thought that was kind of a non-controversial issue. How do you help these kids out? It's not their fault, after all, that they're here. If you want to blame, you know, if you want to blame somebody, they're certainly blameless, and, and uh, we thought it was going to pass, and it didn't. Could I interrupt? For a second, so the International Law Society, which has been invaluable in the administration of this panel, making it happen, uh, can make a short presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Ray Fonseca, and I'm uh, 3L here at the College of Law. And first and foremost, I want to uh, say a quick thank you to Professor James Freeberg for having coordinated and moderated this event. Um, Professor Friedberg passionately works on bringing more international and immigration-related activities, events, and classes to the College of Law. And having taken every one of the classes that he offers here and abroad uh, myself, <laughs> I can say uh, that I know I speak for a lot of people when I say that my experience at WVU has been greatly enriched by all that Professor Friedberg adds to the law school. And second, on behalf of the uh, the student body, the International Law Student Association at the College Law, and also Professor Friedberg's Immigration Clinic. I would like to thank each one of our speakers for coming today. Uh, thank you so much for, your, for sharing your research and your 
uh, expertise with us today. And we're truly fortunate to have some of the leading immigration attorneys in all of the nation with us in our law school today. And as a student who aspires to um, one day serve as an immigration advocate like you all do, um, myself, I'd like to personally thank you for asking, for answering some of the immigration um, questions I had had. Um, and as, at a time so crucial as now in the weeks before an upcoming presidential election. And at this time, my friends and I have uh, a token of appreciation to present to our speakers. Thank you. We'll continue now with, you, you can open your gifts if you want. <laughs> uh, we'll continue now with uh, a question and answer period. I would like the first question or questions to come from a student, because I know when we professors get in the audience, we have these really incisive things that we have to ask. And when professors start getting up and asking questions, students don't like to get up as much. So <laughs> I'm sure it was correct, but I didn't hear that. So um, where's our microphone person? Can you go to, uh, can, can we have a student that has a question? Go ahead. Um, Ms. You may have addressed. Right. Yes, you may have addressed some of um, part of my question, but I was wondering, um, we've listened and read recently that contrary to popular belief, actually numbers of um, immigration or immigrants coming have uh, slightly plummeted. Do you agree with this? And what are some major factors of um, other than the economy currently and the lack of uh, jobs probably for people? What are some other factors? Um, do you think that contribute to this lowering of slight lowering of numbers in recent years? Let me start because I guess I started with numbers. Mm -hmm. um, um, actually, this fiscal year has seen somewhat of an increase in the number of um, individuals coming to the United States. Um, take uh, students, for example. There are more uh, students this year than last year, and the number of students F1. <coughs> J1, M1 foreign students uh, have increased in numbers uh, to pre-2001 um, levels. And so at least in regard to students, there have been more uh, individuals coming to the United States. But in regard to individuals who are in, uh, who would want to come to the United States in categories that are limited in number, they're limited in number. There's not a darn thing that can be done until Paul gets Congress to get, uh, anyhow, until the law changes um, to increase the number of people who are able to come in these various categories. So let me pass, pass the hat yeah, down there. Anybody now. else have reactions to that question? <clears throat> well, I, I think if you're, if you're talking about reductions on the, um, on the undocumented side, or people who overstay their visas or are coming across the border, I think it largely is a, a function of the economy. I mean, the, the, um, when the economy's down, um, the undocumented workers are blamed for it. Um, when the economy's up, they never get, the, uh, <laughs> get their due. Um, but they are largely responsible for the prices we pay for a lot of uh, our productivity in the United States. Uh, but I, I think you know, there, a large amount of it has to do with the economy. And also, I think there's, we're seeing an increase in the number of people being removed from the United States. The, there are, uh, there's been funding, as I said, during the Bush administration for fugitive teams going after people who have final orders of removal and removing them. And so I think there is, one thing is the people who were here as anchors are back home now because they've been removed. Or, and there's a concern that um, you know, people, there's, there's not the opportunity to come here and live um, and work uh, the way there has been in the past. And I, I would just say that in terms of the, the amount of people, there, there's an inherent, uh, I think, ambiguity to, to how, many, um, how many people who are, who are here unlawfully. In other words, 
we, we don't know exactly. So we, we may be able to figure out how many are, are being admitted in terms of the numbers of people who file for, for B1, B2, or F1, or, or H1Bs, but that may not accurately reflect, A, how many people are coming in, and B, how many people are staying. Next question. My question is, what about ex-students? Um, I receive a, almost a daily barrage of emails from otherwise functional adults going on about how illegal immigrants are stealing all our Social Security benefits and they're not paying in and, and we need to get rid of them. And I've tried to explain a few times about how Social Security and SSI and DI and retirement benefits are all different funds that doesn't go anywhere. But my standard response now is why not admit everybody legally and let them pay into the fund and fund our inverse triangle of population that we've got right now with the boomers who are all needing the retirement benefits and no money there. It makes more sense to have people who are immigrants doing the jobs that we don't want to do and paying into the fund. Is there something wrong with my response? I like it. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 the reality is uh, that keeping people as illegal, I mean, the irony of what you were saying is that really keeping people as illegal benefits the Social Security Fund. And it has actually helped to the extent that the fund is somewhat solvent. It's in large measure to all those illegal aliens who are working and not getting any benefit. And the hundreds and of billions of dollars that are, I, I'm yeah, sorry, the hundreds of billions of dollars that the Social Security Administration is holding based upon numbers that are bogus, that where there is not a connection between the money that's paid in and the Social Security number uh, that's at attached to it. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, the humane and just and fair and moral and right thing to do would be to legalize the people and give them the benefits for which they've been working for. But when people make crazy arguments like, you know, the arguments that you've been hearing that somehow they take out of that system, it's actually just the opposite, that they are contributing and getting nothing in return. And indeed, one of the things that happened when, you know, they ended um, in 96 and in 94, was in 94, I guess, the, the Welfare Act, you know, when they ended 96. welfare as we know it, one of the things that they did is make it virtually impossible for anyone who has not been a resident for five years, I'm talking about people who are legally residents, until they're legally residents for five years, they get virtually no benefits in the United States, including SSI and any of the things that we call, quote, welfare or public welfare benefits. So not only do illegals not get any of those, even people who are lawful, who've been lawful for less than five years. Uh, and that's one of the ways in which these systems are maintaining their solvency by people continually paying in and not getting anything. Twisting the question a little further, could any of you con comment on the effect on the economy that the temporary H visas and the permanent EB-1, EB-2, EB-3 visas has, have? Well, I'm sure that there are economists who have done the arithmetic, but uh, the H-1B visas um, are for individuals who are um, working in positions that require college or universities degrees and indeed have those degrees. EB-1 is for individuals who are outstanding uh, professors, researchers, executives, and managers of multinational firms, uh, or aliens of extraordinary ability. EB2 and EB3 are for individuals who are working in positions that have been certified um, as either being uh, serving the national interest or in short supply. So all of these categories have, are for skilled individual performing work that is needed to be performed in the United States that advances uh, the economy. Whether or not it's a trillion dollars a year or, or, or some other number, I, I'm not able to, to uh, and posit. But 
one of the things that happens is the entry level H one B the entry level non immigrant visa is an H one B. And last year I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but a hundred and over hundred and twenty thousand. Over a hundred and twenty thousand applications came in the first day for sixty five thousand visas. Something's the matter here. These are 120,000 applicants uh, who have college or university degrees or greater. These are 120,000 employers or more. And these 120,000 employers are paying up to $2,000 in fees in order, filing fees, not a dime for the attorney, in order to present these cases to the immigration authorities in order to participate in the lottery and maybe get that uh, graduate from WVU who they need. And uh, if there's 65,000 available and 120 apply, well, 120, whatever the arithmetic is, 55,000 jobs are not filled. Visas are not granted, so it's a problem. I was just going to mention that one of the things, the uh, distinction about the 2006 effort on comprehensive immigration reform, which was largely um, associated with Senator Specter right, right in our backyard, um, was that uh, the family-based system would have been reformed in favor of a points system so that the immediate family members would still be covered, but more attenuated, you know, brothers and sisters and, and adult children and, and, and others. Um, it would have used those numbers to create a, a points-based system, with the focus being the quality, uh, you know, a qualitative look uh, outside the immediate family, but a qualitative look at people that we're allowing to immigrate to the U.S. And we'll see that again. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll come up again, I'm sure, in the next uh, Congress, that approach. The floor is open to everybody now. Any questions? Hi. Um, we have a lot of international students with F1 visa here in WVU and all across the country. Um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Hoffman, that uh, if they don't do their um, paperwork correctly or something, and they might uh, be in the category of mandatory detention. So if, if one happens to be in the mandatory detention and they just say that, I don't want an education, I want to go back, uh, well, how, how difficult would that be? Well, let me, let me clarify first before, um, before I answer. Uh, mandatory detention um, would probably not be applicable. Um, it, is, it is kind of confusing, but there's, there's mandatory detention and then, there, then there's detention. So what I said was if somebody is out of status or found to be potentially deportable or accused of being deportable or removable from the United States, those persons would be detainable. In other words, they could be subject to detention. Um, that's sometimes very shocking to the clients that we have because they think, well, I... I just overstayed a visa, or I changed schools. I'm on an F1, and I changed schools, uh, or I, I didn't do something correctly in my paperwork. Um, I'm not saying that, that an F1 uh, violator is nece necessarily subject to mandatory detention, which means I couldn't get him out on bond. Someone like that could be potentially out, get out on bond as long as there's no uh, grounds for mandatory detention, such as crime involving moral turpitude, uh, aggravated felony, terrorism, sabotage, espionage, etc. So um, just to clear the air on that, but, but you're right that that person, which is again shocking to many people, that person potentially would be subject to detention and unless they hired an immigration counsel uh, would probably stay in detention until uh, they were uh, deported from the United States. Um, so I'm sorry, go, go ahead and uh, what was your, the second part of your question? You, you had another question, yeah. For some reason, they're detained. Mm -hmm. the, you know, they came here for education, and some reason they're detained, and they say, I want to go back. Right. I, I don't want to protest. How, what's, what are the complications? And, well, uh, bas basically, can I mean, they just be escorted to the airport and, and, and go? Right. Well, we've had, we've had clients in exactly that position. Um, and basically, um, uh, it, it picks up on something Mr. Virtue uh, talked about in terms of the, the, the uh, unlawful presence bar. And what happens is if the person has been unlawfully present, in other words, out of status uh, for six months, 
um, between six months and a year, then they're barred from returning for three years. If they've been out of status for more than a year, they're barred from returning to the United States for 10 years. It's called the three and 10 year bar. So these are very serious consequences um, and they're, they're basically you know, going to have to uh, find some other way to stay in the United States. But I think the questioner was also asking, yeah. can the person just say, okay, I give up, send me home, of or can the government hold him against his will even no. after he's agreed it, to go Okay, home? well, let me address that point. Um, Yes, the, the, the person who's being detained can always, what we call stipulate to removal. The person can sign an order of stipulation, and that raises other issues about whether that, that signing of that order of, uh, or, or, or stipulation of removal is being done voluntarily. So that raises a myriad of issues. Um, yes, the person can always do that, and usually in my, in my experience, the person then is sent back within about a week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, there is a case called Zadvitis um, uh, and a case called Demore versus Kim, which states that you can't hold somebody uh, for more than six months um, in detention um, uh, if, if there's no reasonable likelihood that the person is going to be deported. So there, there are, there are uh, um, restrictions on the government's ability to hold you. But that's where your country doesn't want to take you back. If, if his country is willing to take right. him back, that pro problem doesn't Right, but arise. you know, I think... I, 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 to, to just you know, pinpoint the exact thing that I think you were asking, if, I, if uh, I'm not mistaken. If you say, I want to go back, and you're in detention, uh, Jeff's absolutely right, you can stipulate to deportation. But the government under existing regulations has up to 90 days to physically remove you, and under Supreme Court law has up to actually six months to physically remove you. So you can stipulate to deportation on day one and remain in custody for six months. And we have had cases where that has been so, not up to the full six months, but people have stipulated right away and it's taken the government four months to get around to actually removing them. And the, the alternative from the government perspective is the government does have the authority to allow a person to voluntarily depart. They're gonna pay their own way home you know, they're not, they're not going to be removed on the government um, nickel, the, uh, which is much more than a nickel now. The, um, the government does have that discretion, and so if it's a case that is not a, a big enforcement priority, they're not going to use up a, one of 30,000 beds, basically, uh, as a practical matter to, to detain that student if there's nothing, if, if there's nothing else going on. Um, so uh, you'll have, you know, a lot of people get voluntary departure. They can leave. Um, students are in a little bit of a different situation in unlawful presence. And even if they've, you know, fallen out of status for some reason, the card that they have stapled in their passport says they're allowed to be here for the duration of their program. And so they don't start being considered unlawfully present here until somebody makes a judgment that they're out of status. And then uh, that really applies just to students, though. Hi. Um, I just, you, you guys kind of uh, brought up the whole H-1B cat thing and whatnot, and uh, well, I've kind of been staying up to date with it, and I just, uh, with it, and uh, I just wanted to get your uh, opinion on this. Recently, there's been an extension for optional practical training periods from 12 months to 29 months uh, for STEM students. Um, and uh, I just want to get your uh, opinion on this, whether or not this would be, if this could be effective to kind of uh, relieve the cap gap. Thank you. Uh, what are STEM students? Um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so these are individuals who graduate with a major that is in one of those four categories and it gets more complicated than that. Maybe you understand the, what the CIS. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a code. It's a, it's, anyway, I, I mean, I, you know, what happened is we, we call this the um, uh, the Microsoft uh, exception to the law because what happened is Microsoft went to Congress. Bill Gates went to Congress and said, "Look, 
uh, you're not providing us enough visas under the H-1B category to uh, bring in high-tech people. I mean, we don't have the people. We need more people. And we're going to move our facility across the border from Blaine, Washington, into Canada. I don't know, by the way, if they did or not. I know they were threatening to do that. Um, Congress refused to budge on the H-1Bs, which from the perspective of all of us who practice up here is just absolutely insanity. I mean, we can't, we, we can't figure out why they continue to do this because the demand is clearly higher. It's not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, change the labor market in any significant way, and it's just hurting American businesses who at some point, like Microsoft, will be frustrated enough and just either export the job somewhere else or literally export the company across the border so that they can bring in uh, more workers. The response was to do STEM, uh, which, you know, as Bob said, is science, technology, engineering, and math, and to give students under optional practical training. If you're a student, you're allowed to do optional practical training for one year after you complete your work, after you complete your studies. So this was designed to say instead of one year, we're going to give, uh, what is it, 29 months? 29, 29 months, 29 months uh, of optional practical training if you're in one of those four fields. And it was really an accommodation to Microsoft and the other high-tech companies. And, yep. and what it does effectively is it allows a student who isn't selected the first time around for H-1B an opportunity to, for the company to sponsor them on the next cycle of H-1B. What happens is that the numbers become available on October 1st and companies can apply six months in advance. So April 1st, as Bob said, 120 or so thousand applications come in on one day for these numbers. Uh, they have to do a lottery to select out the 65. And so a lot of people aren't selected. If their optional practical training, as Ira has described, is going to expire within that next year, they're not going to be able to stick around for the next cycle of H-1B. This allows them to do that. One thing that the government did, though, just to uh, sort of, you, you know, it's a carrot and a stick. For the stick, the person has to be employed by an employer that uses the E-Verify, which is the electronic verification system for checking employment authorization uh, in order to be eligible for this extension of uh, STEM-related optional practical training. And E-Verify is, you know, this controversial system where uh, the employer has to verify against the Social Security database um, to determine whether or not the person is authorized to work. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy around it because they say there's a lot of mismatches, and even the Social Security Administration has admitted that, uh, you know, they have, I don't know, some percent, in, maybe even in the hundreds of thousands or millions of mismatches. You know, somebody inputs the wrong birth date or they transpose the birth date and so forth. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding E-Verify and uh, what they call the no-match system. In other words, what's supposed to happen is the employer is supposed to ask the government if it comes back as a no-match between what you have as your Social Security number and what the Social Security Administration has, they say uh, you can't employ that person because they, you know, they're not verified. One other uh, factor about E-Verify, which is sort of fun, uh, in light of the fact that there's no comprehensive immigration reform, our states, various states, have passed various laws. And so, to make a long story short, in Arizona, employers must be using E-Verify, and in Illinois, employers are not permitted to use E-Verify. Figure that one out. Any other questions? I have a question about deportation. Who pays for the ticket and how does deportation actually work? Are people taken out of detention and brought to the airport with law enforcement or how does it actually work? I think a Republican on the panel should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, it works. It works a little bit differently depending on where the person is. I mean, if they're on the southern border, for example, it means putting somebody on a bus and, and sending them across. Um, it, in some cases, they do interior removal, which means that they're sent into the interior of Mexico, even if they're not from that interior of Mexico, which creates some problems. Um, but by and large, the government pays for the ticket, and some people are escorted on commercial flights by immigration deportation officers. Um, in some cases, the, the government um, uses its own aircraft or charters 
to remove people. So de just depending on the numbers, if they have you know, significant numbers, for exa example, going back to Central America, it may be, it may be a U.S. government flight. Um, and there are removal officers, detention officers on board. Um, but, you know, it, and, and so it happens in any number of different ways. I suppose in some places along the border, people were actually walked back across the border. <laughs> in um, San Isidro, out near San Diego, those, those areas. Just to supplement um, uh, Mr. Virtue's uh, comments, um, there, there is something called a bag and baggage letter, which is uh, an alternative to deportation where the Department of Homeland Security, uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, can send a letter basically saying to report to the DRO, to the T Detention and Removal Office, and then they will basically process that person and give them a time that they can, a time and date that they should leave, um, and then they can leave basically voluntarily. Um, there's also procedures which I've dealt with in terms of cl clients who have gotten uh, what's called voluntary departure, which is another process that the immigration court can order or grant voluntary departure, and the person has to leave, um, uh, usually it's 120 days, a maximum of 120 days, um, and then the person would then um, go to the department, uh, the uh, DRO, the Detention and Removal Office, and um, basically what they do is they give the person a packet, which is a sealed packet, um, then the person takes that to their home country, to the United States consulate or embassy in their home country, presents that to the consulate, and then that's how uh, word gets back to the United States, to the, to the, to the uh, ICE officers in the United States, so that they can get their bond back, because there's a certain bond that, that may be required. I think we have time for one last question. Can't, can't you also um, offer the uh, flight back in order to speed up the removal of the person, the physical removal? Um, in Present a ticket and so you, on? Y yes, you can offer, you can, uh, basically we've had cases where you can uh, uh, enter into negotiations or discussions with the deportation officer. Um, in cases where I've, I've gotten voluntary departure for certain clients, I've then talked to the deportation officer, shown, shown him a copy of the itinerary and the, and, and the, uh, and the ticket. They need a copy of the ticket. Um, and then they verify that the person is actually going to leave. Um, if the person is in detention, then they will take the, the, the person to the airport. And what I've done in, in some cases is I've actually met them at the airport to make sure that they're represented while they get on the plane. But, but that's, that's an alternative, and again, that's a voluntary de deportation as opposed to what Mr. Virtue was talking about, which is uh, deportation uh, by the government. Jeff, could you really briefly explain what the legal benefit is of voluntary departure over sure. physical removal? Sure. Uh, voluntary departure um, is, is uh, a provision under the Immigration and Nationality Act, which basically uh, uh, is, is beneficial in the sense that the person does not have an order of deportation. So there's a 10-year bar to somebody who has an order of deportation or order of removal. The person does not have that 10-year bar. So it's a really, uh, it can be a very good uh, alternative for people who don't have an unlawful presence uh, bar uh, if, they want, if they can get voluntary departure um, and then they can come back in consular process. But unfortunately, a lot of clients don't have that option because they have some other bar like unlawful presence. Okay, I think we're going to have to end it there. Thank you very much for a wonderful panel, folks.